When my guest tonight was 14 years old, she vowed that one day she would go to the Olympics. Over the next 20 years, she ran, jumped, and hurdled her way into the record books, eventually becoming the greatest female athlete of the 20th century. Jacqueline Joyner Kersey competed in four Summer Olympics, winning three gold medals, one silver, and two bronze, while setting the world record in the heptathlon. But before she became the first American woman to win gold at the long jump, did you know she originally dreamed of becoming a Broadway dancer, dug her own long jump pit in her front yard, and battled severe asthma throughout her entire career? Tonight, we'll learn what makes this undeniable icon who she is, a woman who once said, it's better to look ahead and prepare than to look back and regret. Please welcome USA Track and Field Hall of Famer, Jackie Joyner Kersey. <laughs> Have a seat. I'm going to be real honest. I expected you to sprint out here. <laughs> but back in the day. Back no, in the no. day. Uh, it's such a treat to have you on. Uh, your story is phenomenal. And, and to consider where you came from, I know you're really proud of your roots, but it starts back in 1962 in East St. Louis, second of four kids. And I think it's wonderful that your grandmother, Evelyn, says her name has got to be Jacqueline because she is going to ascend to great heights somewhere. And now named after, in essence, the first lady, Jacqueline Kennedy. Yes, and that was really a <laughs> foresight on my grandmother's part because she wrote on the back of my picture that, you know, one day, one day she'd be the first lady or something. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I, I think it's important to point out that when your parents became parents, they were young. I mean, they were teenagers. Your dad was 14 and your mom was 16. And it was extremely tough. You know, because my mother did not finish uh, junior high school. And, but, you know, we just found a way. And with my mom having, you know, my brother, um, we lost an older sister. You know, my mo mother had a, we had an older sister and uh, she, she died. And then my brother, who, Al, who is uh, two years older than I, uh, came in and then myself. But with me being the oldest girl, a lot of the restrictions I felt my mother was extremely strict and the reason she was extremely strict was because she knew that uh, at a young age she had gotten pregnant and she really wanted me to get an education and a focus on trying to make something of my life. And it was to the point where after dark you were not leaving your front yard. I think that she had a, a, real, a, a real reason for being that way. You know, she would make me read the local newspaper so I could know what was going on. She really wanted me to be informed. She really wanted me to just focus on really being the best person I could be and focus on getting my education and making something of myself. Your dad was an airplane assembly worker, and there's a protection element here that your parents provided you, specifically your dad. I, I read where one night somebody tried to break into your house and the next day your dad found him and worked him over. Your dad was respected in the community uh, in as much that if they knew if they messed with his children or his house, they'd have to pay the price. Oh yeah, my dad, my dad was very uh, respected individual in the community and where we lived, uh, there was a tavern or a pool hall, you know, and a lot of activities that was going on and so you and would this see, is right across the street yes right across the street from our home and so you would see a lot of fights a lot of you know people might have too much to drink and you know just start boxing it in the street and but for whatever reason that it would be a group of men that would always sit on the corner and 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 most people would come into that neighborhood probably would think that oh, you know, they're winos, they're this and they that. But really, they were like the gatekeepers. You know, they washed out for all of us. And so whatever that was, ha what was happening, they would communicate, my dad, his friends, you know, so no one knew that we didn't know that would mess with us, right. you know, and so we were protected when we didn't even know we were being protected. My father, uh, 
was just very demanding on all of us. And but he always would say to me to stay focused on what I wanted to achieve, and that, uh, and and it and it was tough at times because of tough situations, a lot of things that I, I didn't like that went on in our home, but. It was something we dealt, dealt with. Just to further paint the picture, you were in a home where when it got cold enough, you know, the pipes would burst and you were, you know, gathering jugs of water. You'd open the oven to try and heat the house. I mean, this, this was as humble a beginning as, as I think anybody that sat in that seat had. I mean, you lived like that, but we didn't complain because we had a roof over our, over our head. But we knew during the real tough months that we would either use one another as body heat, you know, gather together and try to stay warm and try to use the oven as much as possible or sometime take the blankets and try to sleep, you know, where the oven was. And I mean, so a lot of things now you look back was, you know, really a hazard, but we did what we had to do. You know? right. <laughs> you know? You're introduced to this sport and in essence, a track club comes along and you're one of the few that even finishes the race the first time you try it. The first race, yeah, I might have finished that race, but I remember finished last in the 400. You come in dead last. Yes. In the 400. Yes. yes. And, but I, I, for whatever reason, I don't know why I loved it for finishing last, but I did. I enjoyed it. <laughs> and I said to myself, if I continue running, if I can improve a tenth of a second, if I'm running, or a half of an inch if I'm jumping, that meant the work that I was doing was paying off because we really, we didn't have a track. We were running the park and- Your, your, your school didn't have one. No. Right? So this coach has you basically running the neighborhood to and from school. <laughs> now, one day you're running with your friend Carmen, I believe. <laughs> yes. And <laughs> they go by Carmen's house on the route and Carmen says, Hey, Jackie, how about we stop in for your favorite, a ham sandwich? And you stop and you go in and basically cut the route after you eat a ham sandwich and you lie to your coach, right? They always had good food, you know? <laughs> so we stopped in, we got the sandwich, went back on the route, you know, and then coach asked us about the time. You know, we just stretched the truth. We're like, oh, we just might have been a little slow that day. But anyway... What ended up happening, though, is that it bothered me so much that I called Corman that night, and we got up, and we finished that route. We had to finish the route. In the you dark? Know. Yes. You know. The whole thing is what yes. I read. It wasn't yes. like you went to one point and said, so you re-ran the whole thing. Right. We had to, because we well, made Well, you didn't have to. You had to. Nobody told you to do it. No. That's my point. Right. No. No one told us to do it, but it bothered me because I knew that wasn't right. Where do you think that comes from in you? A lot of it is the goal setting, you know, and it's hard to, for me, to achieve a goal when I'm not honest with myself. And so I had to really understand if I'm going to get better, that tenth of a second I'm talking about or that half of an inch I was talking about if I was jumping, I have to put the work in. So how can you get better if you don't put the work in? I think it's fascinating. Your relationship with your brother is so great. I mean, any parent would wish that for their children to be as close as you were to your brother. <laughs> and I know that there was a time in your early teens when you and your brother, Al, make a pact <laughs> that you're going to get out of this situation and make something of yourselves. You know, one of our goals, we saw the Olympics on television and just said, you know, one day I want to go to the Olympics. Did you think at that time track, track and field was your way out? I made the connection. I remember in 76 when I saw the Olympic Games and Evelyn Asher was someone that I truly admired and still admire today. But when I saw her running and I saw someone who looked like me, you know, I always threw my hair in cornrows or and it was the Olympics, and, and I was like, wow. I'm seeing someone that doing something I'm trying to do, and then maybe one day I could go to the Olympics. Yeah, there's that moment for a lot of people that have sat in that seat where the light bulb goes on and they say, why not me? You know what? It, it wasn't so much why not me. I went to Coach, Coach Fenoy, and I said, oh, I want to go to the Olympics. And he said that you have to be willing to work hard. And I'm like, I am working hard. But he was like, no, it's, uh, it's like a journey. You know, and you got to take 
we got our junior meets and there's just different different steps along the way because as I eventually became, you know, I finished last in that first race. I realized that, you know, four through eighth place or ninth place, they receive ribbons and they're always on the grass. One, two, and three is always on the podium. And I'm like, I gotta still get on the podium. So I had to learn what it would take to be in the top three because usually top three make our national teams or, you know, some kind of team you're trying to go for. So I sort of send my sights on trying to learn to become a winner. And becoming a winner was more of me being consistent in what I was doing. And so you're running in the park and you're making your own long jump pit in your front yard. I didn't have an opportunity to practice. So I told my sisters, you know, because my mom would say we couldn't leave home until she got off work. But that's to leave home and stay for a while, like go and play. But she didn't say we couldn't walk over to the park and borrow the sand and bring Never it back to that. the front Wait. yard. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Did I just hear the word borrow? Yes, okay. we can borrow. <laughs> so kids are showing up at some point in the park you and know. where'd the sand go? Right? It's a sandbox, you know? Right. And so we got this potato chip bag, you know, <laughs> little bitty bags. So I told my sister them, I need to practice. So we would take the bags, go pull some sand out of the pit, I mean, out of the sandbox, put it into the bag, bring it to the front yard so I could practice my technique jumping off a banister. And the sand, we never got enough sand for me to practice, but it was a little pile. <laughs> right. As long as I felt like I was jumping in it, like I was long jumping. Really? <laughs> Something major happens in this country in 1972, though, prior to 1976, and that's Title IX. Yes. And that was the government saying that we are going to, for government-funded programs, we okay. demand equality for women and the men. Yes. And that's not just athletics, it's right. activities. But yes. if it's a federally funded program, mm -hmm. the women, the girls get just as much as the boys. Right. But without that Title IX, I don't know that you're sitting here. You're, you're, you're so correct because even when we were in um, high school, and this was right around 1978, 77, 78, and one of the things was that we only had one gymnasium and our practice will always come after the boys' practice, and that would be probably around 6.30. And my mom was like, well, you won't be doing no sports because you're not going to be coming home and then going back. And then finally, we start practicing or sharing the gym, you know, with the boys that would allow us to participate because I did volleyball as well as basketball, being able to uh, be a part of what I call Title IX baby, have made a big difference because it continued to open the doors from the standpoint of, you know, people starting to really appreciate, you know, female athletes across the board. Well, in that, around that 1976 time frame and four years after Title IX, you qualify at the age of 14 for the Junior Olympics. So obviously something has happened here where you've gone from dead last your first time out mm -hmm. to oh, hey, I just qualified for the Junior Olympics. So something clicked in between those two uh, moments in time that, that made you really catch fire there. Yeah, I mean, because I, I had been a, a national champion in the long jump at the age of 12 and 13, but I was running the 400 meters, and Coach Fenoy would put us in what we call the multi-events. And that would have been the pentathlon at that time, the run, jump, throw, five different events and I just love the challenge of trying to in your mind you think you're going to master all five events and that's the challenge because it never happens but you think you're going to master all five events during the pentathlon and and I became uh, the national champion and so and it was just I just loved that event I just loved it you know so so you win <laughs> four pentathlon titles in high school yeah. four and your high school career is phenomenal. I mean, it, everybody's aware now. But what's going on at this time is also a love and a tremendous amount of success in basketball. This mm -hmm. is not just track and field. I mean, you are a fantastic basketball player. And to be honest, basketball was kind of the, the other way for you to get a scholarship 
to get out of East St. Louis and go on to a major university. Is that how you looked at basketball? Y you know what? I wanted to play basketball, but, but basketball really brought the recognition because when you live in a community like mine, and a lot of times we, a lot of schools would have to go, we would have to travel to their schools because they were afraid to come to our schools because they thought their bus was going to be rocked. And so we often thought that no one would, you know, discover us. You know, they'd be afraid to come into the community of East St. Louis. And, and little did we know, college coaches, you know, they don't, they don't care where you are. If you're on a rock, you got some talent, they're going to come. Yeah. And, <laughs> And then we had coaches come from all over. And I remember when um, UCLA, the basketball coach, uh, Billy Moore, and was recruiting me. All I needed was for UCLA to come knock it on the door. Because that's where I really wanted to go. So UCLA comes calling. They want you for basketball. And, and I find it a beautiful tribute to your father when you say your dad scraped together all he could to get you enough money to get out to UCLA to take a visit. Yes, and you know, it was like a, a dream come true for me, but I didn't want my dad to know that I was really excited about going to, so. But you called that the greatest gift your dad ever gave you. Yes, because my dad didn't have the money, and there was no way I could make this recruiting trip. That was a big jump in, in, in your household mentality. Yes, it was. It was a, a huge jump because that money could have been used for maybe just getting food or, or paying a bill. But my dad understood the importance of me taking this trip and to see, you know, because it's going to be so far away from home for me. But I, I just knew that when I went out to UCLA that this is the school. So were your brother and you the first two to go to college in your family? Yes, my brother uh, went first to Arkansas State. Was it all triple jump for him even back then? Yes, okay. triple jump, yes. And hurdles too, he ran hurdles as well. So when he gets to UCLA, you seem to be a goal setter. Is that accurate? And if so, what are the goals you're setting? Because you're there on a basketball scholarship. I didn't know I was going to be one of the starting fives, but I Whatever I decided to do, I gave my all. And my uh, freshman year, I knew that I could be a starter, so I worked towards, I did what, whatever I had to do to help our team out. I just loved the idea of, uh, you know, being in the team sport. Christmas break comes. Your mom is sick. You don't know to what extent, but you don't go home because A, it's expensive to get home. B, you're doing your thing out here and you, so you don't go home for Christmas mm -mm. break. But shortly thereafter, she takes a turn for the worse, and you have to come home. After the Christmas break, things were going well. And right around in uh, January, I remember we had played against uh, Long Beach State. And Long Beach State was um, ranked higher than us, uh, UCLA. And they had the number one player in the country on their team. And I had a really, really great game. And I called my mom, and I was telling her how excited I was. And, had to get my rest, and you know, and then I said, well, you know, are you okay? You know, because I could hear uh, her not, her, her voice was really weak. And so I just, you know, chalked it up to that maybe that, you know, she just wasn't feeling well. And she said she wasn't feeling well, that she was going to go see the doctor uh, tomorrow. Get a call, right? I think roughly around four o'clock in the morning. You got to come home. You got to come home right away. Um, internal bleeding. And little did I know, by the time I got on the airplane and made it back, drove over to uh, East St. Louis to St. Mary's Hospital, and I go in there and they have my mom, like, quarantined, you know, because they're trying to figure out uh, what is going on. And one of the doctors recognized she had fever in her feet, and that was a sign of some type of disease, and then come to find out that uh, she had contracted the, the worst form of meningitis. She was bleeding from every organ in her body. And that, uh, you know, we had on, um, I call it the breathing machine to try to see if sure. uh, uh, she could be, uh, you know, come through it. And 
I had to make the decision to take her off the machine to see if she would breathe on her own. And we did, you know, we got a pulse maybe for, it, uh, it was less than 15 seconds and then it just went flat. And that, uh, I had lost my mom. At the age of 37? Yes, she was 37 and. It had to be hard for you to get back on a plane and leave East St. Louis slash St. Louis with younger sisters. You know, because we were staying at my um, aunt house and how my aunt house was designed where you have the, it was like um, two story, but at this time it was a narrow pathway up to the bedroom. And I remember laying there that night and my mom came up them steps, you know, and, and she told me, you know, that it was time for me to go back. And I knew then that I had to get back on that plane because I had a place to sleep. I had a dorm room. I had all the food I could eat. And I knew that I had a scholarship going for me. So I got back on that airplane, went back out to LA because when I was talking about my mom being strict, everything that she was teaching me is what I had to reflect on to make it through life. And it was the reason that I needed her to be that way because I did not know that she wasn't going to be with me forever because that's what I thought. But all her teaching when I was 10, 11, 12, it was everything I had to really hold on to to make it through and go back out to L.A. and recognize the blessing that had been bestowed on me to have that scholarship. And now it's second semester, track season rolls around. At some point, you're going to the NCAA championships and the rest of your team is in Sacramento, and you're like shipped off to do the heptathlon in Spokane, but they didn't even send a coach. Bobby. Bobby, Bob, <laughs> Mr. Yeah. Kersey, yeah, Mr. is a Kersey coach. Mr. at the time. You and know. he finds out he's a coach, and he goes, wait a minute, Jackie is going up to Spokane, and you're not sending anybody with her? Right. And he ends up paying his own way to go up there and be with you at this heptathlon. You're right. And so Coach Kersey at the time right. <laughs> yeah. travels to uh, Spokane. And for me, I had been having a real difficult time with long jumping. And long jumping is my favorite event amongst the seven in the heptathlon. Then he was asking me, well, now, what is it that you've been having a problem with with the long jump? I said, for whatever reason, I've been having a difficult time getting on the board and the board is the piece that you hit yes before you leave right so you see a long jump you see a strip of tartan we call it a runway and then it's a white board that's about eight inches wide and you hit that and then you jump into I call the sandbox but it's the sand pit and so we're talking on the phone then he said okay well meet me outside your room bring your spikes I'm like oh okay you're in the hotel. Right, we're in the hotel. So he says, mark out your run. I'm like, in the hallway? <laughs> he <laughs> goes, yes, do your run. And he had white tape. He put down a, a, a board, imaginary board, did my run, and had my check mark. And he says to me, I come running through, and I hit it perfectly. And he said, okay, this is the same thing I want you to do tomorrow when you go on the runway, but at least I want you to move back a half a step because we're on the inside and it might be wind or it might, you know, but a half a step would make a big difference. I go out there the next day and I get my lifetime best. I hit the board, hadn't been on the board all year. At the time, I was scoring like 6,000 points and they were scoring like 6,400. And these are cumulative points that pile up during the course of the seven events. Right. And, and, and 6,000 is a great it total. Was, yeah, it was great, but he wanted me, because he showed me that day how I could become a world record holder. And I was like, not with my marks. In each event, you, you see if you can score 1,000 points. So with that 1,000 points, I look at what those times or distance are. So 1,000 for the hurdles might be 1,380. I know I need to be able to go over 1 meter 88 or 6'2 in the high jump. That's the one event you can maximize the points, and it's the longest of the seven. The shot put, 
I know I'm not going to throw 60 feet. That's 1,000. So I look at where my 51, as long as I'm at 850. 200 meters, I know I can run under 23 seconds. That's way over 1,000. Long jump, my favorite event. If I'm jumping 23.5 or above, that's 1,200 points. Javelin, I'm borderline. I'm not going to be throwing 180, but if I can throw 160, it keeps me in that 850 range. 800 meters, I know I can run. I always wanted to be in 210 shape because I know that's about 965 points. So I balance it. That was the reality check that I needed, you know, because I am a firm believer that if you can never face the challenge and find yourself bouncing around, you will bounce around for the rest of your life because you're looking for something that's not there instead of figuring it out. And I had to figure it out. So it started making sense that I had to work on my technique. Well, you set your sights on the 1984 Olympics. Tell us about the opening ceremonies of your first Olympic Games. It really hit home that these are the Olympic Games because the parade of nations and the athletes started coming out. And all I could think about, because at the time, I had an injured left hamstring. And, and it just gave you goosebumps. And it's like, this is real because my brother and myself, we talked about this, but we didn't know if it was really going to happen. And, and I believe it was Jeffrey Osborne's song, We're Going All the Way, and that was our theme song. You know, me, him, Bobby, and our team, we're going all the way. And I mean, think about that. This is Jackie and her brother Al are now on the U.S. Olympic team together. Yes. Which is mind-blowing, considering where you come from. You both end up working your way there. It just inspired you, and it's like you're ready to go. But there was something that was holding me back because I had never been injured before. And I know the biggest competition of my career is about to start less than 24 hours. And going into those games, I realized that, you know, it takes more than just the, the physical, that mentally, you know, I wasn't really there. Coach Fenoy had flown out and, you know, I, I just wasn't myself, you know, because it was like, these are the games. And, but because my leg was bandaged, heavily bandaged, that psychologically I, that must meant something was wrong. So your brother ends up winning the first American gold in the triple jump in 80 years. Mm -hmm. So take us through, <laughs> take us through these seven events and where you are and how this is progressing. So the the first day is the 100 meter hurdles and. I'm running extremely well because in our Olympic trials, I set the, a national record. So I'm looking good in the hurdles, but in my mind, I wasn't looking good at all. You know, I go to the high jump, I'm still in the competition, you know, but I'm still struggling, but I'm making it through. The shot put is the shot put. The 200 meters, <laughs> you know. You hate the shot put, <laughs> don't you? That's how I think about it. Right. But you know what? I got friends that are shot put, and they be like, Jackie, why are you always talking bad about right, the shot right. Okay, so. I don't want the shot right. putting yeah, exactly. world against me. Right. It did shot put. <laughs> <laughs> now we have the 200 meters. I run everything as well. So the second day, the first event is the long jump. Now, I don't care what's wrong with my leg, anything, I'm ready to go. Uh, I'm not even thinking about this leg being bandaged. I'm ready to jump. But what ends up happening is that I attack the board, and it's a red flag that means no jump. So I got two tries just to get one in. I come back down again, thinking I'm being safe, a red flag again. Now I only have one jump left. I if you stay. don't hit it, it's right. over. It's over. And all I could think about, okay, I'm going to be safe. So I come down, and I played it too safe because I ended up being like two feet behind the board. Oh. I only jumped 20 feet, 8 inches. And at that time, I'm a 22-plus jumper, you know. And so I'm devastated, you know. It's like, and Bobby comes out of the stands, and he's like, Jackie, you got to get it together. You know, the heptathlon is the makeup of seven events, not one. So you need to wipe them tears, get ready, because you got to throw the javelin and 800 meters. Sit over here, drink your water, eat something. And I'm like, oh, I'm just crying and oh, trying to get it together get down to the javelin. I'm still, I'm really, I'm still leading this competition. But I'm not aware that I am leading it. You know, it's like I'm just going through the motions. Now, the 800 meters, they're lining us up. 
And at the same time, they're lining us up. They're announcing on the law speaker that my brother, Al Joyner, had just won the gold medal in the triple jump. And it's like... You're leading in the heptathlon, going into the final event. Let's see what happens. And after six events, it's Jackie Joyner, the United States leading. If Jackie Joyner wins the race, she automatically wins the heptathlon. There is her brother, Al Joyner, the triple jumper, watching his sister right now. His yeah. sister is in third place. Jackie's falling back. Jackie's falling back badly. That leg must really be a problem right now. There it is, wrapped tightly, and it looks like her chances are going down the drain. There's her brother exhorting her from the infield, but it is Everett's, Everett's right is going to go wire to wire to win it with none finishing very close behind in second position. And Jackie Joyner, it appears, has lost her chance for the gold medal by finishing that far behind. How hard <laughs> is that for you to watch even now as we sit here in 2016? It's tough, but <laughs> nothing I can do about it. Right. <laughs> I mean, you're that oh, close to yes, gold. Yes, right. I mm. mean, within seconds. Right. And, and so you see your brother. He's cheering you on. And at some point, you're bawling, crying, and the world thinks it's because you finished with a silver medal, oh. but you're crying because you're happier for him. Yes. You know, see his dream become a reality. And my brother came over to me and we were just crying and I was happy for him because he said, Jackie, you ought to be happy. I said, I am. I said, you know, because no one pick you to let alone make the team win the gold medal. <laughs> I'm really happy. You were happier for him. <laughs> yes, and I was happy for him. And I told him, I said, now I have to go in here and do this press interview and I'm not going to allow the media to use my leg as an excuse because I just wasn't mentally prepared, you know, and I told him, I said, if God bless me to make another Olympic team, I want to be the toughest athlete out there mentally because physically I know I could do it and it takes the total package and, and that was my mindset from 84 and trying to make the next Olympic teams. So, yeah, that... <laughs> okay, so now can we, can we spill the secret that Bob... <laughs> comma, coach, Kersey, <laughs> coach, slash, Bobby, <laughs> you're dating, right? I mean, right. at the beginning of this time, you both were dating different people, right. and you're commiserating with one another and all this time together, and now there's a proposal. Yes, because one thing that uh, what Bobby and I, we wanted was to remain friends and to have our relationship was based off uh, a good friendship along, way, uh, along with him coaching me. And because a lot of people ask, well, did you know in the beginning? No, I didn't know in the beginning, but we eventually we spent a lot of time together because when we first met, it was hurdles, blocks, run this, do that. It wasn't love at first sight, you know that? You know? <laughs> so, but throughout our relationship, it evolved and He's always planning different things and surprising me. 1986. 86. Not only do you, you break the record, you, you go through the 7,000-point barrier, which had never yeah, that been was... done or even come close to being done. And, and that was something, you know, we were talking earlier about 6,000 points and down around. Now you're breaking through the ceiling of 7,000 points. Uh, what an accomplishment for you. You know, it, it, it was really uh, a combination of the different coaches I work with and, and them believing in me. 1987, you're on the cover of Sports Illustrated, Superwoman, <laughs> um, minus the cape. <laughs> now you're rolling into the 1988 Olympics, and you are back to being Jackie Joyner Kersey. I want to believe I'm a much wiser athlete. I'm listening, you know, I'm replenishing my fluids like I should. I'm eating in between the events. I am figuring out what it is if there's a distraction at the time. In 88, I was dealing with uh, patella tendonitis. If you ever had tendonitis, you know, <laughs> you know, it can ache and pain, and, but we had it wrapped all up, and, but I was, I was ready. And so when it came down to the 800, the last event, I kind of knew where I was. And let's say this, 
coming out of 84, you had made the pledge to yourself and I'm sure to Bobby, never again. Right. I am going to be focused. I'm going to be at my best. Never again am I going to let myself. myself down. Right. She looks well within herself in the middle of the pack, and people who run much faster than she does are she's still in contact with, so she is in a good spot. She ran under 209, which is a personal record in the 800. The greatest female athlete in the world, possibly the greatest that we have ever seen. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But these are records that you're setting. I mean, that's like, that's Ruthian type record here with, with your point total. And it's not been approached 30 yeah. years since. I know. And that's really, uh, I never would have thought in all my years of competing. And all I could think about when I was getting into the multi-events, how I wanted to break so-and-so record, or what do I have to do to break that record? What do I, you know, and... Well, five days after that record-setting performance and the gold in the heptathlon, it's long jump time. Yes. Let's watch. After Drexler did not improve in her fifth-round jump, Jackie joyner Kersey comes down the runway. Yeah! <laughs> and you can hear Bobby go crazy when the distance comes up on the board. Another Olympic record for Jackie Joyner Percy, and Bobby's knocked out over it. Seven meters 40, 24 feet three and a half inches. <laughs> he does celebrate, doesn't he? So, was your husband excited about that? Was he? <laughs> oh my God. I mean, he pulled a groin celebrate. I know. <laughs> Tore his patella tendon. <laughs> right. It's uh, just amazing, though. What is it about the long jump? Is there wait, this, this sense of flying? I mean, you watch the video, and it's like it's breathtaking to watch some human run yeah. and jump that <laughs> far. But for you, what is, what's the joy in that? You know what? The joy in it for me, it goes back to the park in the sandbox, uh, an event that I practiced on my front porch, jumping off a banister that... Didn't know if I would have broke a leg or something in a little pile of sand because it was an event that I loved. And, you know, and for many years, I had problems with my steps, trying to connect here, there, and, and everyone always wanted me to just do other events, but I always wanted to just long jump. This was an interesting Olympics, though, because it was the one that was tainted by yeah. all the steroid talk. Ben Johnson, they stripped him of his medal three days later. Now, this, there's this cloud hovering over, and when you see somebody like yourself doing things that have never been done and haven't been done since, people start saying, well, she's chemically enhanced. So you're having to deal with all this right after the greatest Olympics any woman's ever had. Yeah, and you know, and it was really, it was just, I felt that it was unfair and that, and it was unfortunate because the men's 100 meters went before their finals were before our competition began. And when Ben Johnson was stripped, then there was just speculation everywhere, people talking and whispering. And, and it was just hard, you know, but all I kept saying, I'm just going to focus on what I have to do. And, and that's all I could do, you know. And it was, it was hurtful at times, too, because people, you know, were just saying mean things. Mean things, nasty racial things. Yeah, yes, you know. Well, I'm a person, I look like a gorilla, and I mean, you know, they would... That yeah. hurt, didn't it? I mean, even when you say that now, all these years later, you're looking down as you say that. Yeah, because, you know, the racial connota connotation with that is just like, you know, but it, it, it just took me back to, you know, I'm going to still get out there and do what I know how to do. You're not so, getting the respect from media you know, that, that you were worthy of. Yeah, I think that, um, but I don't think that had anything to do with uh, drugs. I, I don't, I, you know, it was always, they were comparing me and my sister-in-law, you know, or trying to put a riff between us, you know, or that I wasn't attractive and she was. I mean, just all kind of mean things and why a company would want her versus me and, I mean, just nonsense, you know? But again, I can't control, 
I can't control that. I can only control me. And that's why I always want to be very consistent in our sport, you know, and no one can take away my hard work and what I try to achieve. Does, yeah. <laughs> There's a point there where you get a little burned out, right? And, and you start your foundation. And that is your way to really influence and give back. You know, and I, it goes back to when I lost my mom. And I went back to that center. And I started wondering where the kids go, you know, in the neighborhood. And that was back in 1981. But I didn't have resources. And I didn't know it would take money to open up that center. So what I did have, the sponsors who worked with me in 88, that it allowed me to take those resources and really uh, support different organizations that I had been involved with. And now you're, you're back to training, right? right? The burnout is gone. You know, in your world, every four years, I'm sure there's a time when the, your calendar turns when it's like, okay, now it's time to start going. And, and here you are pointed toward Barcelona in 92. Yeah, and they're going for the third time. Everybody was questioning, you know, am I going to be healthy? Can I go over 7,000, you know? And I proved them all wrong and went over 7,000, won the gold medal, back to back in yeah. the heptathlon. <laughs> and it's at that time, it's at that time that Bruce Jenner says you are the greatest multi-event Olympic uh, athlete of all time. I know, and uh, Bruce was at that got me at the finish line, and he said that to me, and I was... And, and he was a hero of yours. I, know, I right. mean, you go back to 76. Yes. I mean, there was nobody better than Bruce Jenner. Right. So you're getting this validation from somebody who was a hero of yours. Yes, and it was, it was just great, because not only was it Bruce there, but it was him and Tracy Austin. They were both there, uh, the great tennis player. Sure. And, yeah, and so when Bruce said that, it was like... Okay, so there's one more Olympics coming, and it's on American soil. Yes. <laughs> and I would imagine, not having asked you before, you're gunning for that 96 Olympics because it is in the United States. Yes. And it's going to happen in Atlanta. The heptathlon comes, and you injure yourself. Mm -hmm. Hamstring again? Yes. And I was warming up, and I was just really having a difficult time. You know, I could feel the leg kind of grabbing. And then Bobby was uh, sitting over in the stands, and, and he said that, uh, he said, what do you feel? I said, I, I feel good. I'm going to try it again, like that. And before I could turn completely walking back to try it again, I hear this voice saying, that's it, Jackie. I'm not going to allow you to do that to yourself. And I'm like, I know I hear Bobby because, you know, if you're on the field, you get disqualified, you know, because the competition hadn't started. And I'm like... And I look over my shoulder, and it's Bobby, and he said, no, let's pack it in. Give yourself a chance to uh, go for the gold in the long jump, because I would have three days rest, you know, before the long jump qualifying round. Who'd you get calls of encouragement from? I read Aretha Franklin. Yes, I, I yes. Uh, Lionel Richie. There was uh, after, Arsenio Hall. I mean, yeah, it was just really great, you know, and I put myself in the final, so the next day, I'm warming up, ready to go, leg is wrapped, you know, and I uh, go through the first jump. You know, literally, I thought I was jumping 23 feet. It said 21, it's like, oh, gosh. You know, I'm like, oh, you kidding? Oh, gosh. Okay, let me go back. Come on, leg, we in this together, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and I just kept talking to myself, just said, it's gonna be okay, Jack, it's gonna be okay. And it got down to my sixth and final jump. Now, you know, at this point, this great Olympic athlete, this is it. Yes. This is 1996. There's not going to be a 2000 for you no. in the Olympics. This is your last effort in an Olympics. For Jackie on the runway, her last competitive effort in the Olympic Games. Twice the heptathlon gold medalist, one silver from back in 1984. Won the gold medal in the long jump in Seoul. And she does it, 22, 11 and 3 quarters, 7 meters on the button. Jackie Joyner Kersey doesn't win the gold, but she does medal. Jackie Joyner Kersey wins her sixth Olympic medal in her final competitive effort.
There yeah. it is. <laughs> You've called that. That even that even watching that made you catch your breath right here, right? I mean, yes. You, you called that your medal of courage. That that's the one you're in some ways most proud of. I'm most proud of it because it came full circle. In '84, I doubted myself, and the leg in '96 was far off worse than it was in '84. And on that final attempt, as I stood at the top of that runway, you know, I said to myself because I would visualize everything I wanted to do. And I said, I'm going to attack that board, I'm going to climb in the air, and I'm going to hold myself up. We try to hold ourselves up in the sky, I mean, in the air for a second. You know, and hey, if the leg goes, they're going to send a gurney out there and they're going to pick me up. But I'm going to give it all I have to give, you know. And 84, I didn't have that. <laughs> It's better to look ahead and prepare than to look back and regret. I, that seems to be, after, after sitting here with you for this long, the perfect Jackie Joyner Kersey quote. What, what does that quote mean to you? You know, that quote, it means the world to me. And it started from when I was in the sixth grade. And one of our, my teacher, name was Miss Young, and one of her students came back. and. I remember him telling us that prepare yourself today because I regret some of the things I did now. And I, that always stayed with me, you know, because I think that the results come in the preparation. You prepare yourself. You give yourself the best chance possible. And then you won't have regrets because at least you know you had given your all. And so, and that's what that quote means to me. Sports Illustrated says you are the greatest female athlete of the 20th century. This, this is something that, that validates all that hard work, isn't it? It validates it from the standpoint of, I always take you back to the people who believed in me, who saw the potential that I did not know that I had, and I wasn't looking to, I just wanted to go to the Olympics. I didn't know I was blessed to eventually become an Olympic champion or a world record holder, but I continued to grind and stay with it, and so to me, Yes, I might accept the accolades, but I accept it knowing that there's a lot of people that's been a part of my process and my dreams and making my dreams become a reality. Allison Felix, at this most recent games in Rio, where you were, you attended, broke your all-time medal record. How'd that feel to have that record broken? You know what? It's... Uh, Allison is someone I mentor and my husband coach her, and I think it couldn't happen for a greater person, you know, and I just think that it's just great that she was able to do it, and, and she's going to get more medals if she decides to continue on. <laughs> What's next? What's next for Jackie Joyner Kersey, who has accomplished so much? What are you working on now? I uh, continue to do my work in the community, um, East St. Louis. I have a really great facility. If any of you come that way, come visit us and see what we're doing. You know, in East St. Louis, that w that's going to be something that I'm going to always be doing. But uh, whatever I can do to continue to impact and inspire, you know, young people and people in general to be the best that they could be. How proud would your mother be of not the athlete that you became? but what you're doing in the community of East St. Louis? Oh, you know, I, I want to believe that, you know, she is so proud. And I know that she is because, you know, even through some of my darkest times and sometimes when I'm just, uh, you know, not feeling good, you know, that, you know, along with God and her, I always tap me on the shoulder that we got you, you know, and... And that just makes me feel, you know, continue to feel blessed. All right. We go from that to the ridiculousness of fun questions here at the end. You ready for this? No. You didn't sign up for this. <laughs> That's okay. We'll add to your pay. Okay. <laughs> we are not paying her a dime. Uh, would you rather go without the Internet or a car for a month? Car. Really? Yeah. I mean, I know you can run, but... 
I mean, come on. For real, you can bike. <laughs> you can bike? Yeah. But the internet? Yes, the internet. What are you doing on the internet? On. What is this? I gotta to know what's going, going on. on. Yes. All right. <laughs> Would you rather have a one minute conversation with your past self or your future self? Future. Remember that? It's better to look ahead <laughs> That may go down as the best answer in the show ever. Would you rather be married to a mime or an auctioneer? <laughs> hey there, Jack. We're going to wake up at 7 o'clock. We're going to wake up at 7 o'clock. We're here at 7.10. How awful would that be? I know. But it's like... <laughs> right. <laughs> If I could bring the money in, auctioneer, no. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. So you're going. No. Mime no. or auctioneer? Yeah, you want mime. silence no, or loudness? No, no. no. Mm -mm. <laughs> silence, yes. Okay. <laughs> silence. You, you want the silence? Would you rather have a third eye or a third arm? Think about how great that would have been, like in the javelin or the shot put. <laughs> Maybe that would have been the key to 8,000 points somehow. No, I. I? Yes. I got to see you coming from all angles. <laughs> hey. I cannot think of a more worthy person of being on a show called Undeniable, because there is nobody more undeniable than Jackie joyner Kirsten. Thank you, guys.